Thank you. I'm Larry Maley. I'm the president of USA Powerlifting. And we're here really today to discuss the issues that impact us in terms of fair play for women. And some of you may well know that USA Powerlifting is involved in a lawsuit in Minnesota, and we have been for approximately four years. The issue being contested is one of whether transgender women should be in the women's division and whether in so doing that creates a fundamental unfairness for women. And it, it's been a long process for us and I'll go through it just briefly for you to explain how we got to where we are today and why we made some of the decisions we've made. When we started looking at this issue and we originally started looking at it in 2015, we, we asked a question of how do we balance inclusion and fairness? And we consulted and we went to the IOC policies at that time, which basically said you should strive for inclusion, but each sporting federation should make a decision based on fair play. And so we started the process of, of asking questions about if we include transgender women in the women's division, what the impact will be. And so the first question we asked in terms of that was, is there really a difference between men and women in terms of specifically powerlifting performance? And we did a series of studies to look at that and we studied 17,000 powerlifters worldwide. And what we found is that men outperform women in powerlifting depending on how you analyze the data between 43 and 65% that's how much stronger men are than women. And, and for that reason, and we started in 1981, the first meet that USA Powerlifting ever held was a women's nationals. Um, because of that, we have a separate women's division. And so that reinforced our belief that there really is a difference between men and women in terms of powerlifting performance. And then we asked the question, why would that be? For, for obvious reasons, I mean, it seems obvious probably, but we also have access to youth data and our, our thought was that if you mature as a male, then you carry with you some advantages that are immutable. They can't be changed. And we studied our youth data and we looked at the youngest of children for USA Powerlifting, that's eight and nine year olds and we found there wasn't a significant difference in performance for a variety of reasons probably. Girls um, for the detriment of boys are probably more poised and more technically sound, if you will. But at 10 and 11 years old, the differences start to emerge and that's coincident with the emergence or the onset of puberty. At 12 and 13 year old, the difference is profound. It's almost 30% and as power lifters age into adulthood, you see the differences that we found. And so the question is, again, can we include trans women in the women's division? And so the next question for us was, can that be mitigated? Can you overcome those differences? And so we looked out there and we consulted experts and looked at the data and it looks like with hormone therapy, there's about a 10 to 12% reduction. There's some more recent data that says it's less than that, but that still leaves us with a 30 to 50% difference in terms of performance. And that can't be overcome. So our decision in terms of our policy was, you can't include trans women in the women's division because that is fundamentally unfair to women. Um, so we, we thought about I mean, USA Powerlifting is a, a welcoming and friendly organization. We thought about how do we get people involved and how do we do it in a way that is not inherently discriminatory. And so we consulted experts within that field. We talked to the gay games and to see what they were doing about it. And they developed a division called the MX division. The MX division is for transgender and non-binary and supportive people, and we made one. We have an MX division. Um, and it's growing, small but growing. 
Um, and we thought that was a reasonable way to include people and to welcome them. And, and as I said, we're a, a friendly and welcoming organization. So whoever comes on down and lifts, everyone in the crowd cheers and they don't care. They just want to see people do their best. And we offered that opportunity. Flashing forward to four years ago, we were basically sued in Minnesota. It started with the Minnesota Human Rights Commission, but is now in district court in Ramsey County, Minnesota, where we're being sued for discrimination. And we have received a summary judgment. We'll, I'll get back to that. We disagree, obviously. Um, that says that we are liable for discrimination in Minnesota under their statutes. Um, it's been a significant hardship for us, but it's been very difficult as well over time. Um, in terms of the sentiments of our own constituency, and over the course of this process, um, we've had the occasion to talk to numerous people, both male and female, to, to gauge their sentiment. And what we found is that people universally or virtually universally support our policy, but people are also reluctant to talk about it. And some of us who have been at the forefront of this issue um, have suffered for that. And the same goes for particularly for women who would speak out on the issue. Um, they receive threats and are characterized as bigoted, and um, the threats are, are across the waterfront, really. Um, they have to do with threats to vocation. They have to do with threats of association. They involve media attacks. And some of us have received physical and uh, other threats directly. So um, to, to speak out on this issue for us and for a number of our constituents, our members, has been very difficult. What we know privately is that many people support us and believe that the path we've taken has been the right one to, to ensure opportunities and fairness. Um, moving ahead to where we are today, um, we have been ordered out of business in Minnesota. Judge Patrick Diamond of Ramsey County issued an order on April the 11th that said, you may not do business in Minnesota. You may not sell memberships. You may not hold competition in Minnesota. And that directly affects about 650 to 700 people. Um, and, and so they have no opportunities to compete. Interestingly enough, this lawsuit is about the inclusion of trans women in the women's division. The impact, however, is widespread. It involves men, they can't compete. It involves youth, they can't compete. And in order to do so, those who still have a membership have to travel out of state to compete somewhere else, creating basically a hardship for them. Um, we've appealed this decision, and as of Thursday, we filed our appeal with the Minnesota Court of Appeals, and we believe that Judge Patrick Diamond got it wrong. We believe that he misinterpreted his in legal interpretation of the Minnesota statutes are wrong, and let me be a little more specific. In the Minnesota statutes, discrimination is banned with an exception in sports unless it alters the fundamental character of that sport. And from our standpoint, allowing women to be beaten by 30 to 50 percent fundamentally changes the character of sport for women. But we believe as well that Judge Diamond has gotten it wrong on a number of legal points, though there's things we'll contest in the Court of Appeals. One of the things that, that comes up in this argument very frequently is the issue of the science. And part and parcel of our decision in Minnesota is that basically the science doesn't matter. Um, that the issues of mental health, the issues of prior unfortunate circumstances are more important than fairness in sport. We heartily disagree with that. So, as I said, 
we are appealing. Over the course of time, we've had a number of conversations with women, and what we found, and what you'll see today from the, the lady standing here, is that there's a great deal of anger on their part, and the anger is at the loss of opportunities, the anger is at the loss of history, and that history goes back to the development of women's sports, and as a, as a former coach of the women's national team, it's been a long time coming for equality in terms of women's sports. And so they're angry about the loss of that hard work and that history to get to where we are today. But more than that, they have a sense of personal loss. The lo sense of personal loss has to do with the fact that they, like all athletes, work for years on end to perfect their craft, to maximize their performance, to peak at the right time, and the fact that they believe that in many circumstances they will go to a competition, do their best, and lose anyway is, is heartbreaking for them. And so that's what we found. Um, we found that there's a great deal of anger at the loss of personal space. Um, and personal safety in terms of perception. In short, they feel victimized. And as I said, many of them have been threatened both in terms of social media, but personally. Mischaracterized in terms of personality and fairness and bigotry, which isn't true. We disagree, many of us, and some of us here even disagree on how to approach this issue. But what we really agree on is that sports must be fair for women and that the playing field must be level. There must be equal opportunity. We agree on that. We describe it differently often, but that is something we all agree on. And we believe that if these decisions are allowed to stand, they are inherently discriminatory to women who were born and who matured as women. The last issue I want to touch on is the issue of inclusion. And one of the issues is that we are lobbied heavily and sued for full inclusion. And the problem is that we have offered over time multiple ways to allow for inclusion. I mentioned DMX division. We've also put on the table the idea of following the dominant international federation's rules for inclusion of trans women. It involves monitoring of testosterone. I will tell you that's not the whole answer, but it's an answer. And we have offered a handicapping system if trans women are potentially 40% stronger, say, and you handicap them by that 40%, the playing field is level. I will tell you that that was universally rejected. And so we conclude that this argument is really not about inclusion. This argument is about dominance. If you know that you can go to a competition and be 40% better than your competition, it's about winning. It's not about fairness. And that's where we are today. Um, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Marshy and she will continue the discussion, but thank you for those of you out there listening and, and please, if you would, um, if you support us, contact our national office. Um, if you believe that this is true, if our position is correct, then please lobby for fairness for women politically and otherwise. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. My name is Marcy Smith. Um, I'm a former NCAA backstroke champion and the co-founder of ICONS, the Independent Council on Women's Sports. We're a nonpartisan nonprofit and we're devoted to expanding, empowering, and protecting women's sports. 
Recently, we have seen the opportunities and protection for women and girls eroded. We need a voice to defend the respect and fair treatment of our next generation of female athletes. And we at ICONS want to be that voice. We commend USA Powerlifting for their dedication to firmly defending the rights of women and girls in their organization to ensure equal opportunities and fair treatment in their sport. This case goes beyond this single sport, however. It goes even beyond women's sports. It sends ripples beyond the borders of Minnesota as well. We're here in Dallas, Texas today, um, prior to a competition they have this week. For the first time, a judge has not only taken access to a sport away from little girls and women, but has decimated powerlifting for boys and men um, across the entire state of Minnesota. This radical erasure of an entire sport is a grave warning to other sports organizations that unless they are willing to knowingly discriminate against women and girls at every age and every level, their beloved sport could be next on the chopping block. We all understand the injustice of this. We all understand the injustice of this. All of Minnesota's girls are being targeted and mandated to accept sex discrimination in order to accommodate the preferences of one single male athlete. And USA Powerlifting is not willing to accept that without a fight. At ICONS, along with the rest of the women here and many more that couldn't join us today, we are joining their battle for justice in the sport. The Independent Council on Women's Sports will be filing an amicus brief this week before the Minnesota Court of Appeals to ask the court to correctly interpret the Minnesota Human Rights Act to protect the rights of women and girls to compete in their own eligibility category against other women. We have over, 40, over 55 signatures and statements from now, sadly, former Minnesota USAPL members who have signed onto our petition in support of fair treatment for female athletes at iconswomen.com. We encourage everyone to support their organization in their appeal and contribute to female athletes in this and other legal battles we must fight right now. Please contribute again at iconswomen.com and sign your name alongside them on our petition and contributing and, and consider contributing. And I'm very excited to hear from the rest of the female athletes on this panel. Here's April. Good morning. My name is April Hutchinson. I am a powerlifter from Canada. And this year I have a placement on Team Canada. I won't be referring to my federation um, just out of fear of getting suspended. Um, I started my, my journey into powerlifting in 2019 as a way to help me with some mental health and addiction issues. It was in 2019 that um, I lost my will, my fight, my strength to, uh, to live, basically. I, I, I thought there was no end or no cure or help for my addiction. I ended up attempting to take my own life and um, I ended up in the ICU unit on a breathing tube. When I woke up, I, I basically had two options. It was to either to live or to die, to give up. Well, um, when, I received, when I got out of re or, sorry, ICU unit, I um, checked myself into a, a rehab. When I exited the rehab, literally the day after, I started powerlifting just as a means to keep fit, to keep active, um, as a way to release any type of emotions I might have like anger or, or fear or depression. In 2019, as you all know, was only probably a couple months before COVID had hit the world and flattened it. At that time, everything was canceled, uh, jobs were lost, 
Um, I still was working, but I had a lot of extra time on my hands. So I started training in my friend's garage. I would work every day and then go and train for about two hours after work. Within a year, I had numbers that would qualify me for Team Canada, the national team. Um, at that time, there were no competitions. There probably wasn't a competition for another a year after that in uh, 2021. When I went to that competition, I ended up getting gold medal, and which gave me the placement onto Team Canada and sent me to Worlds in 2022. Um, during this time, I did discover that one of the athletes who I had been talking to was a, uh, a male-born athlete, a biological man. I asked this individual if he had planned on competing at uh, the next competition or let alone going to Worlds or Nationals. This male-born athlete replied that he, he would be going and competing. I told this individual that I thought that was completely unfair to biological women. He then blocked and deleted deleted my contact information. We never spoke again. When I went to my federation to explain the matter and to tell them there was a male-born athlete, they simply ignored my pleas and my emails. Again, uh, a year later, I contacted them and they actually sent me a letter of disciplinary action and threatened to suspend me if I talked further about the situation. Since then, I've actually received two letters one just actually last month about um, myself not being able to speak out. You know, if you do speak out, you will be kicked off this uh, Team Canada um, team this year and I will not be able to go to North Americans coming up in August. So here I am trying to train and peak and be excited about a competition that I worked so hard for, not knowing if I will make it or be able to go. When I asked the Federation um, if they're going to be doing anything about it, they say, April, it's okay. There's only one, one trans identifying athlete. It's not a big deal. Just deal with it. So I ask you, is it okay if one athlete weighs over by 2.5 pounds on competition day, do they still get to compete? Is it okay if one athlete tests positive for banned substances? Is it okay to let that one athlete go through? One is too many. One violation is too many. I'm here today to support USA Powerlifting because as you can see, it is affecting men and women. If my federation doesn't at least talk about the situation or talk to our, um, the international governing body about changing the policy, I do fear that our sport in Canada will be suspended and there will be no more sports for both men and women. As you can tell by my personal story, I need powerlifting as a way to help me with my emotions, just to help me with my day-to-day -day struggles in life. So, of course, I have so much fear and sadness thinking that that could be ripped away from me. But in a sense, having this male-born athlete compete, it's already being um, taken away from me. So. I just I, I ask anyone out there, if you do support um, fairness in women's sports, please um, donate. I do have a website. It's called I Stand With April. You can donate there. But please keep speaking up. Um, don't be afraid. Men and women, please use your voice because the discrimination against women needs to stop today, now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jade Dickens, and I proudly stand up here with USAPL and ICONS and thank them for this opportunity to be able to speak out with my voice for all Texans, for all female athletes in Texas. I am a proud mother of two daughters and also have been a long-term member of USA Powerlifting for over 20 years. USA Powerlifting has allowed me as an individual to explore 
the world. They have allowed me to be able to share my experience and share my knowledge with other athletes, with other girls. I have been so proud to be a member of USA Powerlifting for all of these years, and nothing makes me prouder that they are taking the stance to protect not just me, but every other female that wants to step onto the platform. Larry, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking this on, because I know it's not been easy. Men and women of all ages deserve equal opportunity and access to sports. That's true. That's very true. We all deserve equal opportunity. I found my, sport, my, I found my love for sports later in life. Um, my first, I, I gave birth to my first child at 16. And so you can tell that that might have slowed me down just a little bit. However, I began working in the Texas prison system at 19 years old. There, we hold several fundraisers throughout the year to support other organizations. We were able to do a Special Olympics fundraiser, and we did a bench press competition for throughout the state. And so it was one unit you know, competing against another unit. I got, to, I got picked by my coworkers to be the one female, you know, in most of these, you always have to have the one female to be on the team so it's created equally for everybody. And I got the opportunity to do that because me and my coworkers had been training at night uh, whenever we took our breaks. And I've always loved the weight room. The weight room has always been a passion of mine. I never thought about competing. But as soon as I got up there and I did the lift for that Special Olympics uh, fundraiser, it was there. <laughs> it was there. I started looking around and found a competition, a powerlifting team just 20 minutes down the road from me. And it was our, is our vice president. Uh, Johnny Graham, who's been my head coach for over 20 years. With the ability to, in this knowledge, I then took it to our public school system. And there I coached and taught for eight years and was able to bring the love, my love of powerlifting to other female athletes and was able to experience the joy of other girls, of, of, my, of my girls finding their strength, knowing that they could be strong, knowing that even though they may not be as strong as the boys, because they wasn't, but they found their strength within their selves. That was one of the most glorious feelings of my coaching career. We were able to win state. When my girls went on and won nationals, I was able to expose these girls to not only lifelong lessons, but I exposed them to the simple things I was fortunate to take one girl to the first time she'd ever went to the beach. And then she becomes a naval officer. Another girl of my female athletes took her on her first plane ride because we had to, USAPL, thank you, allowed us to come as a team and compete across the country. She now owns her own salon. And I have so many more examples of what my children and my athletes did and how successful they were. I myself have got to be able to travel the world. I've been on multiple world teams. I've been on multiple national teams. 
I know what it feels like to stand on that podium and have the national anthem playing when I'm standing in Mongolia. It's amazing. And I never will quit. This is something that I will do forever. People kind of joke with me and tell me, you're probably going to die in the gym, aren't you? I said, yeah. I said, if I could have it my way, that's, that's pretty much where I'd like to be whenever that time comes, because that's how much I love it. And I still, to this day, promote female athletes and trained female athletes to become bigger, faster, and stronger. It is unfortunate that Minnesota is, has taken the actions, that the one judge has taken the actions that he has to remove these opportunities from everyone. That has a lot to do with why I stand here. I also, through the help of Texas Values and Save Women's Sports, I have helped advocate legislation down in the Capitol here in Texas, which I will continue to do as much as possible, whenever possible. We have to stand up. We women have to stand up and let our voices be known. We have been pushed to the back and we have been silenced because men want another place to dominate. And they have come to female sports to do that. Is that fair? No, it is not. I have worked way too hard to be dismissed and exiled from my sport. I know I'm in my rightful place. And I know men and women around the country will stand with us. And just let your voices be heard. Say enough is enough. Keep doing it. People are listening. Thank you. Thank you, Icons, for allowing me this opportunity. Thank you, Larry, for preserving my sport. I can't thank you enough for that. Good morning. Um, my name is Taylor Silverman, and you can probably tell by looking at me that I'm not a power lifter. <laughs> but I'm, I'm happy to join USA Powerlifting and Icons here today to share my experience as a skateboarder, because in skateboarding there are many males competing in women's divisions. I've been skateboarding for 12 years, and for the past several years I've traveled around the country competing. And on three separate occasions I've competed with males in women's divisions once in California in 2018, once in Illinois in 2020, and a third time in Nebraska in 2021. And it was a different male each time. In both Illinois and Nebraska, I was bumped out of first place into second place. And in the third contest, not only did I lose out on first place and the recognition that I had earned and deserved, I also had my paycheck cut by Red Bull while the male received $5,000 of prize money intended for female athletes. I remained silent during the first two contests. I knew that these athletes had an unfair biological advantage over the women, but I genuinely thought that this would be quickly resolved due to the absolute absurdity of it. I was also nervous to speak up publicly due to the bullying and even violent threats that I had seen faced by anyone who dared to question so-called trans rights activists advocating for male inclusion in female sports. But after the third contest and watching this only get worse, impacting more women in skateboarding and 
hearing of stories of this impacting just about every other sport, I started to feel really guilty for not standing up for myself and the other women who are facing this issue. I couldn't stay silent anymore because I knew this was bigger than me, bigger than skateboarding, and women in all different sports competing on all levels were facing the negative impacts and many people felt like they couldn't use their voice. <sighs> women were losing records, scholarships, respect, and in some sports, even safety and privacy in places like locker rooms. As someone who'd lost out on first place and lost money to males in my sport, I knew my story mattered and needed to be heard. I couldn't go on letting people think that my silence meant I was okay with it. And I also knew from many private discussions with other female athletes, parents, and coaches that a lot of people agreed with how I felt. So I reached out to the contest organizers at Red Bull and raised my concerns about fairness, about women losing out on opportunities with prize money, and they completely ignored me. I felt forced into silence, and my mental health was suffering because of it. Going through this was so confusing, upsetting, it was mentally tormenting, and the male athletes demanding to be included in our divisions argued that I must accept it because not doing so would hurt their feelings. But my feelings were never considered. The female athletes' feelings and mental health did not matter to them. So I ask you, what about the women? Why does a group of people who claim mental health is so important to them completely disregard the negative impact that female athletes face? Why are the detrimental effects to our mental health ignored? Female athletes are being made to feel completely worthless in a space that was supposedly created for us. And when we speak up about it, we're told to shut up and deal with it and wrongfully accused of being hateful and discriminatory. I know many girls and women who have chosen to no longer even participate in their sport because it's just not worth it anymore. The thing that they love to do most is not worth the abuse, the attempted brainwashing, and males making a complete mockery of their hard work and dedication. I don't want other female athletes to continue to go through this. I know how it feels, and I felt a moral obligation to speak out not only for me, but for other female athletes in skateboarding and other sports and the next generation of girls who may never know what it's like to have equal opportunity and fairness in sports. So over a year ago, I shared my story on social media and it immediately went viral. I received hundreds of thousands of, supp of supportive messages and comments from others who felt exactly the same. And all of us who want to restore fair competition for female athletes are not anti-trans, we're pro-woman. I actually think the males who feel entitled to participating in women's sports divisions need help with their mental health too. But being allowed to unfairly compete in athletics with women at the expense of women is not the, health they the help that they need. It's not female athletes' responsibility to deal with transgender identifying males mental health issues and it only hurts our mental health when people try to put that on us. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cassidy Comer and I'm a retired female athlete. Um, I'm honored to stand with USA Powerlifting and Icons in order to support this cause. I was recruited to play basketball at Midwestern State University in Wichita Falls, Texas. And I am honored to stand here and speak before you all today. I'm here to share my own story and to speak on behalf of millions that feel the same as I do but do not have the same voice. The underestimation of the importance of this issue has become a major problem, and I strongly feel that we stand at the precipice of either a major win for women everywhere or the destruction of women's sports as we know it. 
I have played basketball since I was 11 years old. I began my journey with this school team and discovered a love for the sport. I was one of hundreds of thousands of girls who share the same story. As I went on to play in AAU basketball, I chose to practice against males who are males, and I discovered the innate differences. For starters, I'm very tall. <laughs> I never played against a girl that was taller than me. This is important to note because of both the average size and the average strength of men versus women. Any height advantage I may have had over other women is completely overshadowed by men competing in the same position as I do. And in strength, this difference is even greater, as noted before by these great people before me. Men have numerous biological markers that cannot change even after undergoing re hormone replacement therapy and ensure that sp in sports like powerlifting, they can dominate. On multiple occasions, I have chosen to play against men in training. In practices and scrimmages, I saw that even junior high boys were taking on high school level girls easily and winning. In practices, I quickly realized that the strength and speed difference, differences between the two sexes were immense. I confidently approached games against and practices against girls, but each time I went, uh, each time I went against a man, I walked out with a sense of defeat because even though I had given my best, I had still fallen short. The separation of sports based on the biological truths of age, sex, and in some sports, weight, is for the safety of the athletes. And now this is at risk. Though there is always a possibility of injury in competition, especially at the collegiate level, shouldn't we seek to limit how many injuries we are potentially facing that can be career ending in some cases? The very acceptance of men and women's sports would not only place these women in more harm, but they could lose their own roster spots, places with their teams or federations, and they can lose scholarships or winnings. In the case of sports like powerlifting, it means that any records set by women are decimated by men who could not compete in their true division based on biological sex. How is this fair to women who have worked tirelessly to build their strength enough to compete at such a level? So often in this discussion, we only address the physical risks of women being forced to play alongside biological men. But there is also a very real emotional and mental risk. We as women athletes fight for the chance to earn limited roster spots at the collegiate level and in places like national teams. This of course includes hours and hours of training, strength and conditioning works, individual lessons, and more, in the hope that we might reach that next step in our athletic careers. But it also means that we make many sacrifices. We don't have free time, we work, we go to school if we're in school, and we train, and we sleep, and we eat, and that's it. We put any, every, every other thing on hold because of the sport that we love. We push ourselves to what we can, to the limit of what we can do physically. But when we have to face someone who we cannot expect to, con to succeed against, who has the advantage of male puberty, male bone density, male heart and lung size, male fast twitch muscle fibers, and every other anatomical difference that defines the differences between the sex, it is not fair. For as long as, as men and women's sports have existed, they have been divided by biological markers of age, weight, and of course, sex. These markers exist to keep the athletes as safe as, as safe as possible. And now these are all at risk. So please, please stand, use your voice. I know there are so many women out here who feel the same. So please use your voice. Thank you. Riley Gaines had a emergency meeting this morning. She had to fly out last night, but we're gonna um, play her video recording and her statement. Hey guys, this is Riley Gaines. I'm a 12 time All-American swimmer and the advisor for the Independent Woman's Voice. And I just wanted to share my support for USA Powerlifting and protecting women's sports, protecting sports, protecting the sport of powerlifting in general. 
Um, in my senior year of college, we were forced to compete against biological male Leah Thomas, who was formerly Will Thomas, who swam three years on the men's team at University of Pennsylvania before deciding to switch to the women's team. Um, I watched as Thomas won a national title, beating out every female in the country by body lengths. Um, the next day of competition, Thomas and I raced in the 200 freestyle, which ultimately resulted in a tie. And upon tying, the NCAA told me, official told me that I didn't get to take the trophy home because Thomas deserved it all for pictures. Um, the message that sent to me was that we were reduced down to a photo op to validate the feelings and the identity of a male at the expense of our own. Not to mention the locker room scene and what that looked like and what that felt like for us as women. Um, we felt as if our privacy and our safety and our dignity didn't matter. Again, as long as we were appeasing this one person. And to be totally frank, what that looked like was we were undressing next to a six foot four, 22 year old male, fully intact with an exposing male genitalia. Unbeknownst to us, we had no forewarning of this. Um, it felt like betrayal. Um, the people who were supposed to be protecting us failed miserably. And that's why I'm so incredibly grateful for Larry and for his team for not backing down, for standing firm and saying that women's sports should be for women. And I'm acknowledging how this is now a lot bigger than just women's sports. This is affecting the sport of powerlifting as a whole. Um, it, it's now affecting men, um, especially in the state of Minnesota where this is all taking place. And so um, I, I can't even put into words the betrayal I feel for those girls, um, for again, the sport of powerlifting, their feelings and how they're being overlooked. But I applaud Larry for not backing down. Um, he has my support, he has the support of many. What his team is going through in regards to the appeal, the court case is an abomination. Um, and again, the message it's sending is that we as women, we don't matter. And that is not true, we do matter. We deserve safety, we deserve privacy, we deserve equal opportunity. Um, it's a federal law that we do. Um, so again, my support is with you, Larry, and these amazing girls who shared before me their testimonies and their support. Um, I could talk about the effects of this forever, but just know that we're behind you, Larry. Just a few brief closing remarks, I guess. I, I'm grateful for the support of all of the women here who have taken the risk to come out to tell their stories, um, some difficult and some painful, and for the support of USA Powerlifting. Um, we were the first NGB to actually address this issue. Um, we were the first to actually say that it matters, and it still matters. And if you believe that, um, please, the most important thing you can do is to speak up to know that there are people out there who will support you if you do um, and, and help with the negativity that you may well experience for it um, and make your voices heard. Um, know that you're not alone and, and be politically active. Um, continue to enjoy your sport and know that we want the best for you um, contact our national office if you'd like to support us further. Um, contact ICONS. Um, contact these women individually if you would. They can direct you um, both to assist them but to assist in the issues in general. And again, the most important thing is to support women's athletics and to make your voice heard. Again, thank you. Yes. Um, can you explain to the people why fight this battle in Minnesota instead of say we don't have to do it in Minnesota? Well, I guess your question is why are we fighting in Minnesota? I guess the easy answer is we don't really have any choice um, because we're being sued there. But, um, but the bigger answer really is that it, it could be Minnesota or it could be anywhere. Um, but, but this is where the battle lies today. And the, the issues remain as important, um, both as a national precedent setter, um, but for the protection of women and integrity in their sports. We fight in Minnesota because we have to, but we would fight anywhere.
to the Supreme Court. Um, it, No. Um, and, and just to rephrase Tim's question, Tim's question was how far are we willing to fight? And, and it's, it's a principle issue. And the issues, the, the principles here are about fairness and equality. And um, that's really, for us, a, a level playing field, a fair playing field is what we're all about. Um, it's our 43rd year um, and, and we, have fought for fairness in sport, and we started fighting for fairness in terms of strength-inducing drugs, and this is just another uh, another phase of that. So, you were even willing to create another division. Yes, we did, did actually. It, The, to, to rephrase Tim's question, the question is about the MX division that we formed um, for transgender and non-binary people to um, basically preserve the, the fairness in the single sex divisions for want of a better description, I guess. Um, and we did that because, again, we wanna be inclusive. And if, if you know what the USA powerlifting is like, um, we're really sort of a family organization. We're almost 30,000 now, but, um, but if you go to a meet, everybody supports everybody, and it's, it's really a remarkable thing to see a competition where your competitor, who you may well beat if you get this lift, cheers you on to make that lift. That's how we are. That's what we're about. And, and that's how we are regardless of where you're situated. And, and that's why the MX division because we want to include people and we want to um, support them as well. And, and knowing that people fight personal battles to get on the platform to begin with, we applaud that. But we don't applaud it in such a way that it takes away from other people's experience and performance. Um, your earlier question, how far will we fight it? We know we're a national landmark. Um, we're, we're really, Although there are a number of other cases in the country looking at sports and looking at um, inclusion versus fairness kinds of issues, we also know that we're at the forefront of that. And, and the unfortunate downside for us is that we're really a sports organization. We're not political. Um, we just want to have sports. Um, but we, we are forced to become activists to preserve our our lifestyle, basically, and uh, our perspective on fairness. And uh, Larry, have you had any dialogue with the LGBTQ uh, community? And if you share that dialogue, I can, I can imagine that there is quite a few that actually agree with you. One, one of the interesting things about powerlifting is, is that it's as I said, inclusive, but um, with, with many sports, there are uh, a high number, I guess I could say, a, a noticeable number of, of gay and lesbian people involved. Um, almost across the board, um, of, of all the people we talk to, they're supportive of this position, because regardless of their um, personal preferences and lifestyle, um, they come to USA Powerlifting because they perceive it to be a fair and welcoming place. So um, re regardless, um, those of our members um, who are similarly situated are supportive. Um, most of the criticism and, for want of a better description, the brain damage we receive um, is from outside of USA Powerlifting. In, in surveying our own members, um, particularly in Minnesota, 95% are supportive of our position. Because um, at the end of the day, people know what's fair and what isn't.
Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you.